Hey, what's up my friends? Grant Baldwin here. Welcome back to the Speaker Lab Speech Breakdown, where today we're going to be taking a popular TED Talk from James Veach. Now, James is a guy that we have done a speech breakdown for before. Uh, James uses a lot of humor. He's very entertaining. We're going to talk about today uh, how he uses uh, pauses very, very effectively for humor. He also uses slides really effectively. Now, at the beginning, we're also going to talk about the power of storytelling and opening and closing loops. Lots to get into. Let's get right into this with James Veach Speech Breakdown. It's funny the things you forget. I, uh, I want to... I kind of like that for an opening line of delivering a line, kind of letting it think, sit there and give the audience a chance to kind of think about it, process it, of him saying, it's funny the things that you forget. And I'm immediately wondering, like, what are the things that we forget? What are the thing? Where where is this talk going? I wonder what he um, uh, what he's going to do with this line. So, so one thing that you want to think about as a speaker is opening and closing loops. So opening a loop means that he he just brought up here. Uh, it's funny the things that you forget. And so immediately in our minds, it's open this loop of what are the things that we forget and where is this talk going to go? And so we don't necessarily know what, how that's going to play out. And so he'll come back later and kind of close that loop and talking about the things that you forget. But uh, it's a good it's a good exercise as a speaker to look for those opportunities to open a loop in the mind of an audience that keeps them engaged and keeps them moving forward with you. I see my mother the other day and uh, she told me this story that I, I'd completely forgotten about how when we were driving together she would pull the car over and by the time she had got out the car and gone round the car to let me out the car, I would have already got out the car and pretended to have died. All right, so a couple things he did really well here. One is he starts to tell a story, right? And so he seems kind of serious. Now you know, because you, you know James, that he's a comedian, he uses a lot of humor, so you assume this is going to lead to some type of funny punchline, which obviously it did. But this is a good example of when you start a story, you know, my mom reminded me of this story. Whenever I was little, one of the things that would happen is uh, she would pull over in the car, and, this, and so we're immediately like drawn it, like where's this story gonna go? Maybe it's gonna be sad, maybe it's gonna be disappointing, maybe it's gonna be scary, uh, maybe it's gonna be funny, we have no idea. I just keep looking at the image here. Uh, we have no idea where this story is going to go. The second thing I was going to say is that uh, the, the image is what delivers the humor. And so anytime that you, ha if he just described the story, when, my, when I was little, I would get out of the car and I would play dead. It's, it's funny, right? Him just describing it, but it's even more funny, it's even more powerful, it's even more effective if he shows the image. Now also look at the timing of how he delivered that. So you can go back, let's go back here, and you can see that he delivered the line at the same time he clicks ahead to show the image. So it creates kind of the simultaneous uh, humor. Let's go back here. By the time she had got out the car and gone round the car to let me out the car, I would have already got out the car and pretended to have died. Boom, right? So same line, the delivers the line at the same time he shows the image there, uh, and that creates, a, that creates even more humor than if he had just said the line. Now the other thing is because it's just a funny image, it's smart of what he's doing here, of just letting it hang there, right? Just that alone, like I, I was cracking up earlier just looking at this while trying to talk because it's just a funny image. So just letting that be there creates a lot of humor and let the silence continue to, to help the humor build. <laughs> it's a great picture. Because that's how you die. And I remembered that was, a, that was a game I used to play with myself, to entertain myself whenever I was bored or, or frustrated. <laughs> Settle down. People say we live in an age of information overload, right? I, I don't know about that, but I just know that I get too many marketing emails. I got uh, a marketing email from a, a supermarket firm, which uh, will remain nameless for predominantly legal reasons, but which I'm going to call uh, Safe Mart. I got an email from them, and it said, it went like this, it said, um, just three weeks until Safe Mart at King's Cross opens. And I resented this because... Again, one of the things that he does, that James has done with a couple of his other TED Talks, is that whenever he's referencing emails, it's one thing just to describe the email. So I got this email that said, you know, three weeks until this grocery store opens, right? So him saying the email is one thing. It's another thing though, is if he shows an actual visual, now obviously this is just kind of a recreation of that, but shows a visual of the email, so we kind of, we kind of go there in our minds of what this would be like to get an email that says something like this. Not only do I not remember signing up to that, but I resent the fact that they appear to think that I should be excited 
about a shop opening. So what I did is I,、um, I scrolled down to the bottom of the email and I pressed、uh, unsubscribe. And I thought that'd be the end. Again, it's just、uh, it's a simple little thing of showing the image, showing a, a little gif there or whatever it is that he did. It's a gif or gif. I never know. Put in the comments. Let me know what it is for you.、Uh, so just showing that again brings some some like visual element to him to it versus just him visu-、uh, verbally describing it. End of it. But a week later, I got another one that said, "Just two weeks <laughs> until Safe Mart at King's Cross opens." And I thought, well, obviously I haven't clicked hard enough, right? So I I tried it again, right? Lo and behold, a week passes. You guessed it. Just one week until Safe Mart at King's Cross opens. And here's the problem. The internet gave us access to everything. Okay, now also let's talk about this in terms of how he's telling this story. So he starts with three weeks, and then he goes to two weeks, and then he goes to one week. And so we kind of know what's happening so far, and we can kind of go there in our mind. And so if this goes on for too long, then it starts to feel like, okay, we'll get the idea, get to the point, right? And so you want to make sure that if you're telling something that's got some of these details or got some of this background or some of this buildup to it, that you don't take too long to get to the delivery, to get to the punchline. So three weeks is fine, three weeks, two weeks, one week. But if it had taken, let's say he. Was like you know, I get this email six weeks, and then five weeks, and then four weeks, and then four weeks. And I'm thinking, what in the heck is going on? And then three weeks, and then two. It would be like, we get it, all right. So let's just get to that point. So three weeks is fine, but just be aware of that when you're building up towards the punchline of a story or a joke that it doesn't take too long. The setup doesn't take too long before you get to the delivery. But it also gave everything access to us. You know, I think right. It's hard enough to discriminate between the things that genuinely matter in this world and you know the minutiae of life without having emails about supermarkets. I'm gonna point out something else here. But it also gave everything access to us. You know, I think right. It's hard enough to discriminate between the things that genuinely matter. In- okay, I want you to I want you to look at the faces of the audience for a second. Now you can see that a lot of them have either a smile or a slight smirk or a little laugh to them because of James. Because they know he uses a lot of comedy, he uses a lot of humor, and so that's something that they've come to expect from him. So as a speaker, you want to make sure that if you are someone that's using a lot of humor, it creates this anticipation within the audience of what's coming. They have. We have no clue where the story is going to go, other than he's tried to unsubscribe time and time and time again. We have no idea: is this going to be funny? Is this going to turn dark? Is this going to get serious? We have no idea what's going to happen. But because James uses a lot of humor, then he has that going into the talk that the audience has this anticipation and this expectation that wherever this is going, this is going to be funny. Now, so you can see that on their faces here. So something to be aware of again as a speaker in terms of the perception that you're bringing to the audience before they see you speak. In this world, and you know the minutiae of life, without having emails about supermarket chains and Candy Crush saga, and I was really annoyed with them. And I thought, okay, I should just—I was about to write a strongly worded email, which I can do quite well. Good pause. And I thought, no, I'm going to find the game. So I replied to it, and I said, I literally cannot wait. <laughs> What do you need from me? They go back to me. This guy called Dan said, "Hi James, I've asked a colleague to help me with your query. <laughs> like it needs help." I said, "What's the plan, Dan?" I'm thinking fireworks, bouncy castle. I'm not sure what you mean. Again, if he just verbally said these things in terms of here's what the exchange is, I said this, they replied this, they, I said this, they replied that. That's fine, but it's not nearly as powerful, not nearly as effective as visually showing it. I said I'm just tremendously excited about the opening. <laughs> Do you want to put the bouncy castle or shall I? He said I, th- I think you have misunderstood. A new store is opening, but there is no celebration plan. I said, "But what was all the three weeks until two weeks until emails?" I was getting excited. <laughs> I'm sorry you're disappointed. <laughs> I said, "Not to worry. Let's do something anyway." <laughs> Besides, the deposit on the bouncy castle was non-refundable. <laughs> If we don't use it, we're out a few hundred quid, Dan. <laughs> He said, "Mr. Veach, I'm not responsible for anything you have ordered." I said, "Let's not get into who did what." <laughs> 
Okay, so again, uh, it looks like I'm assuming he's showing all of these things as he's describing them, but do you see the difference between him just verbally saying them when you can't see the slide versus when you can see the slide? And it just, again, it adds a level of, of, of effectiveness um, to the presentation and to the talk. Fine. You and I are in this together. <laughs> Question, would he be there to make sure people take their shoes off? The other thing too, if you're noticing, uh, as he's showing these emails, sometimes it's just one line that he pops up there, but sometimes it's multiple lines, and so he lets it build. So I'm gonna show you one line, and I'm gonna kinda deliver the punchline for that, and then I'm going to deliver, I'm gonna show you the second part of it, rather than just delivering it all at once. Because anytime you put any text on screen, what's immediately going to happen? The audience is immediately gonna go to the screen, and they're just going to read everything that's on there. They may just skim it, they may just read it word for word, uh, but they're not going to be listening to what you're saying. So if if, if in this case, he is putting up multiple lines there, they're going to be reading ahead. They're going to be getting to the punchline ahead of him. So that's why he's putting them up one at a time. Now, I'll be honest, then my relationship with Dan deteriorated somewhat because the next email I got was this. Thanks for your email, your case number is... Oh, it's outrageous. I said, Dan? And I got... And I was just like, this is... And I, I said, Dad! And he just, he just kept, kept going. And I thought, this is terrible. All I'm doing is collecting case numbers. I said, I said D-Dog? <laughs> the store is now open. <laughs> I said, but Dan, I must have wondered why there was no bouncy castle. And then we were back to this. <laughs> and that might have been the end of the story. But I remembered that anything, everything, even something as mundane as getting out of a car, can be fun if you find the right game. So. Okay, good job there of making the transition. One, he makes a good point. Anything can be fun if you find the game in it, right? So, he's, uh, so he delivers that, and you can hear a little bit of snickering, <clears throat> and then he says, so. And so now we know, like, okay, he's getting this. What's he going to do with this? Where is this going to go? So that is one of those lines that he, um, he could have even, like, hung on to a little bit more or pushed a little bit more of uh, saying, uh, you know, I'm always looking for the fun, uh, looking for the fun and the game in the Monday. So, and just saying it like that kind of drags it out a little, minute, a little bit more so the audience is immediately like, yes, what's he going to do with this again? Where's this going to go? This is what I replied. <laughs> and we just, uh, <laughs> it was like we were dancing. It was just a beautiful relationship. We just kept, kept going and it was, it was, it was lovely. But to be honest, guys, it was quite labor intensive. And, um, you know, I had other stuff to do, believe it or not. And so uh, what I did is I have a little, uh, I have a little um, uh, email auto-replier program. And what I did is I set it up so every time it receives an email from SafeMite, it just pings one back, right? So I set it up, and it says, thanks for email, your case number is, and then it has a little formula that I wrote uh, to up the case number every time. And I put it on the server <laughs> and set it running. Again, the great example here of the pause is what creates the humor because the audience now is getting to the punchline ahead of him. They are immediately seeing how this is gonna play out. They find it funny without him having to say anything. So pausing can be really, really powerful and really, really effective for, for humor. I'll, I'll be honest, guys, then, then I forgot about it. <laughs> I checked back on it the other day uh, and it appears um, there being a number of emails going uh, back and <laughs> we're on 21,400. <laughs> Now again, it's one, it's one thing for him to say, you know, we're up to 21,000. Like, people are like, whoa, that's crazy. It's another thing for him to visually show it, and especially the scrolling there of all those may add some power to it. It, it gives me an immense sense of satisfaction to know that <laughs> these computer programs are just going to be pinging one another, you know, for, for eternity. <laughs> and as the legacies go, I don't, I don't think that's bad. 
So, guys, just remember, right? If ever you feel weighed down by the, you know, the bureaucracy and often mundanity of modern life, don't fight the frustration. Let it be the catalyst for whimsy. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you, John. Good job. All right, there you go. Hope you enjoyed that speech breakdown. As always, if you like what you see, you want to see more of it, don't forget to like and comment on the video below. Make sure you let us know in the comments what you learned, what the takeaway was for you that you're going to be applying to your next speech. And if there's other speakers or presentations or talks that you would like to see us break down in an upcoming video, don't forget to subscribe so we can keep bringing this goodness to you on a weekly basis. All right, my friends, we'll catch you next time. You're awesome.